invite him in today. As the spirit moves in this place, sing it out. today.
God, we're thankful, Lord, that you are faithful. God, let us have hearts this morning of gratitude, of thankfulness, Lord, as we reflect back on this week, Lord, celebrating Thanksgiving, God, but we are most thankful for you today and your faithfulness in our lives, God. No matter what comes our way, God, you're faithful. So come on, sing these words with us. Rain came, wind blew, but my house was built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Sing that. thankful, Lord, for your faithfulness, Lord. God, we are thankful for your faithfulness. Knowing that whatever we walk through in life, God, you're more than able to walk through it with us. God, we thank you for that today. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did when did I throw away faith for the impossible and how did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles You are more than me.
declare that this morning. we claim that today in your house, Lord, that you are more than able. God, to come through for us today, to speak to us today, to move in our hearts and our minds and our lives today, God, you are more than able. So whatever walk, God, we come in here with today, let it be a walk of disbelief, of unbelief, of maybe a little bit of belief. Whatever it is we come in here with today, God, speak to us individually right where we need us today. God, thank you that you are more than able. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for singing. Go ahead and have a seat. Hey, Rock Creek. Y'all still hung over from Thanksgiving. Hey, Rock Creek. There you go. And all of you joining us online, let me be the first to say to you, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Come on, it's Christmas time. Yeah, 29 more sleeps till Christmas. I can't wait. Can't wait to see what Santa brings me this year. So excited. Maybe some new shoes. What do you think? What do you think? Maybe? Yeah, maybe just buy them for myself. It's great to see all of you. I'm glad that you're here today. There are, this room is filled. So obviously we got to stop canceling Saturday night service on Thanksgiving weekend. But it's good to see all of you and those of you joining us online. Welcome, welcome to Christmas at Rock Creek. Doesn't the stage look cool? Team did a great job. Come on, give the team a hand. They worked all week. So if you haven't figured it out yet, we're going to look at this familiar Christmas story this year through the lens of the elements of the movies. All the key elements that are in a movie, we're going to look at the Christmas story in relation to that and make comparisons, and it's pretty cool how they all fit together. I don't know if you know this, but in America, and and that's where we live in case you're wondering, in America, Christmas and movies are like Forrest and Jenny. They go together like... Peas and carrots, yeah. Like, like big blockbusters always come out at Christmas, but everybody loves Christmas movies. And let me just tell you, I'm not going to talk about the fake Christmas movies. We're going to talk about real Christmas movies, not the stuff you've been watching on Hallmark since October 1st. <laughs> That's not real. We're going to talk about the real classics. Those are reruns, rewrites, the real classics. How did this happen? How did America... And Christmas get connected in with movies. Well, you have to go back to a particular era of time. And that era of time was the, the time of World War II. See, see, Americans had lost hope. They were discouraged. There was death. There was lack of joy. And Hollywood saw an opportunity to somehow take 90 minutes of screen time and bring joy and encouragement to the life of an American who was dealing with discouragement, death, loss, Hitler. All of those things, they capitalized on it, and they started cranking out movie after movie, and now they are classics that you and I watch every year. Miracle on 34th Street. It's a product of the era. A Christmas Carol, Holiday Affair, Christmas in Connecticut, And my wife's favorite, White Christmas, which today, thank you, God, he just made it feel like Christmas. 
But now we have modern day classics. It, it didn't just start in the World War II era and stop. It has continued on through the years. Come on. Christmas Vacation. It's a classic. It's a classic to all of us because all of us have a crazy cousin Eddie. All of us. It's a classic. The Grinch That Stole Christmas. Home Alone. One and two. Hey, just a little side note. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but maybe you don't know this, but have you ever noticed there's a girl sometimes that plays electric guitar, hip horse, Diana Rain is her name? She is one of Kevin McAllister's cousins in Home Alone 1 and 2. She actually went on the trip when Kevin got left home alone, okay? <laughs> just a little side note. Just want you to know that. Polar Express, and then the Academy Award winning great Christmas classic, Elf. My parents hate Elf. They need to learn to laugh. <laughs> but then there's one that's on every single Christmas that is the classic of all classics. Come on, say it with me. It's a wonderful life. It's a classic to me. Obviously, it's not to some of you. Let's say it again. It's a wonderful life. Yeah. So Hollywood capitalizes on this, this desire for a 90-minute escape. And so they start kicking out all these movies, capitalizing on this need for joy and encouragement. The only problem with that era, but also the only problem with today's era, is it's a 90-minute escape with popcorn. Because at the end of the 90 minutes, here's what happens. Somewhere along the way, the movie comes up and says, the end, the credits roll, and the hero that you thought would save the day actually doesn't save the day. That's why Die Hard is a Christmas movie, <laughs> because the hero doesn't save the world. And people would pick up their coats, they would leave the theater, they would walk out to their car into the world that they had left 90 minutes previous. Nothing had changed. The hero didn't save the world. But the Christmas story, the epic of the true Christmas story is different. Because on the other side of the Christmas story, watch, the hero really does save the world. The really, really does change the world for all of us that have watched the narrative and experienced it. So welcome to Rock Creek and Christmas at Rock Creek and our series, The Real Star of Christmas. And here's what we're going to do for the next five weekends. We're going to walk these elements of the movie. Today, we're going to talk about the producer of the movie. Next week, we're going to talk about the director of the movie. Week three, the supporting cast. By the way, they're still taking auditions for the supporting cast. If you want to be a part, you can. Number four, week four, every, every movie has a villain, and so does the story of Christmas. And in all of our Christmas Eve services this year, the title of the message will be the title of the series, The Real Star of Christmas. So let's get started. Let's meet the producer. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but the producer's name is on the screen, but the face we never see. The producer's behind the scenes making everything happen. The, the producer is underwriting the expenses for the movie. The producer is controlling the movie. The producer decides what the story is going to be. No producer, no movie. And the story of Christmas, the real star of Christmas, is produced by none other than, write this down, God the Father. It's very important that you understand this. It's God the Father that is producing. By the way, the name is on the screen, but the face is rarely seen. God the Father is the producer of the greatest story ever told, the story of Christmas. Now think about it for a minute. I've been your pastor for 15 years, but I've, actually I've been preaching now for 30 years this year. This is our 30th year in vocational ministry. And of all the years that I've been preaching, whether it was to teenagers, whether it was to young married couples, or whether it was to y'all, very rarely have we ever done a complete series on God the Father. In fact, I, I can only remember one or two times we've really done a deep dive on God the Father, and it was when we did a series on the Lord's Prayer because Jesus said, and we're going to see this in a minute, he said, our Father. So that's where we unpack that. We talk a lot about Jesus, and we should, amen? We talk a lot about Jesus. We preach a lot occasionally about the Holy Spirit. We just sang about the Holy Spirit. By the way, I'll give you a hint. That's next week. Talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit, but very rarely will we do a sermon about God the Father. And here's what you need to know today as we unpack this. The Bible, your Bible, my Bible, this is my Bible, this isn't your Bible, but you have a Bible. Your Bible never, ever attempts, watch, the Bible does not attempt 
to prove God's existence. You ever thought about that? Like there's nothing in here that is like intentionally proving God's existence. Watch. It just declares it. It just declares it. Like the motor's already running when you get to Genesis 1-1. Ready? In the beginning, God. Enough said. End of story. God has always been. God will always be. God is not a, a, a being that was created and someday. He is an eternal being. He has always been. And in the beginning was God. I love how Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. See, see God, in, in his way of looking at things, watch, proof is not necessary because he's already existed. And he just doesn't feel that he needs to prove his existence to you. Watch, because evidence of his existence is all around you. Just the glory of everything around you is proof that God exists. Paul wrote it this way in Romans 1.20. Since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. If you need any more proof that God exists and has always existed, I would encourage you to unpack and study the scientific design of the eye. I don't know if you know this, but there is a moment when a baby is in its mother's womb that that baby, he or she, whatever gender it is, at some moment, when he or she is at that pivotal moment, somehow, some way, a laser perfectly cuts one eyelid into two. Perfect. See, see, there is proof that God exists. People say to me all the time, Pastor, I, I don't know, I just, I, I don't believe that God exists. You realize that's like holding an iPhone 15 and the iPhone 15 saying, I don't believe Steve Jobs exists. The proof is in your hands that God exists. Not only that, I've had people say, well, I don't believe in God because God didn't meet my expectations. Write this down. If God met all your expectations, he can never exceed them. So quit trying to get God to meet your expectations. Instead, trust in God no matter what the expectation is because he has always existed. And so while Genesis and Romans tells us that he made everything, the challenge still remains the same because we have to somehow in our human intellect grasp the godness of God. And remember when my mama told me God made me and I was special. God made you and you're special. You're uniquely and wonderfully made. And I remember as a kid, when I heard that God made me, immediately my mind went, well, who made God? Have you ever thought that? Have you ever went into the black hole of thinking, what was before God? And how did I get here? And how did all this happen? And you'll drive yourself crazy trying to answer the question because, listen, you don't have to prove that God exists. He just declares it. So what or who exactly is God? Well, let's answer the question. Because before we can ever talk about how the producer produced the movie, we got to find out a little bit more about him. Genesis 1:26, God said, let us make man in our image. Did you notice us and our? It's plural. Is it not plural? Let us make man in our image. It's plural. But Deuteronomy 6:4, which is a verse that every Jewish person has to quote every morning when they awake, Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So which is it? Let us make man in our image, or the Lord our God is one. That's confusing, is it not? Well, here, I'm going to help you. I'm going to make you real smart. You can use this tomorrow on the job. The word for God in Deuteronomy 6, 4 is Elohim. It's a Hebrew word, Elohim. You know what that means? Plural. So even when the Jewish people say the Lord our God is one, they are declaring that he is one, but he is three in one. It, it, it's the expression or it's this word called the Trinity. I had somebody one time tell me, Pastor, I've, I've unpacked and I completely understand the, the doctrine of the Trinity. I'm like, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, 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 no. It's like an egg. It's got a shell. It's got a white. It's got a yolk. Nope. You don't understand. No, no, no. It's like water. It can be frozen. It's a solid. It can be a vapor or it can be liquid. No, you still don't understand the Trinity because it's vast. And you'll never fully comprehend the Trinity. By the way, let me just say this to you. If you, if you have a God that you can fully comprehend, he is not God you are. And who wants a God that we can fully comprehend, right? 
I want a God that I don't completely understand. But watch this. God said, let us make man in our image. And guess what? You're a trichotomy. Did you know that? You're a body, you're a soul, and you're a spirit. You're a reflection of God. But even then, you're really not a trinity in comparison to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so as we unpack Christmas this year, write this down. Jesus was not a human who became God. He was God who became human. So we have to understand he has always been there. Always been there. He was at the beginning. He was at creation. So here's what we have. In this vastness of the Trinity, here's what we have. We have an eternal creator God, the Father, the producer. We know God personally through his son Jesus, God the Son. And his presence is with us now and forever in God the Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. Now, the only way you and I can really truly know God the Father, this producer, the way you and I can have a relationship with him, know about him, hear from him, is this word revelation, through his revelation. Now, let me just tell you, you have the complete revelation of God right here. God's holy word, the Bible, is the complete revelation of God. Now, now, when you read the revelation of God, and you read it on Monday, and you go back and you read the same verse on Tuesday, it might read a little different to you. That's not revelation. That's illumination. The Holy Spirit illuminates things to you as you read the Word of God. This is the complete revelation of God. My Bible, your Bible. So we know God through His Word. And I know sometimes as we're trying to unpack this revelation of God, it's like, man, my brain just can't wrap itself around that because my brain just doesn't wrap that far. How many of you feel that way? Yeah, my brain just won't wrap that far. So, so let me illustrate it to you so you can kind of understand how the revelation of God comes through the Word of God and how you can know God but yet fully not know the mysteries of God. Let's just say after church today, we go down to, um, let's go to Love Field because it's cheaper to fly southwest, and, and let's jump on a flight and let's fight the crowds of everybody trying to get home from Thanksgiving, and let's maybe catch a flight to San Diego. Now, they're two hours behind us, so we got plenty of time to get there before the sun sets. So let's fly into San Diego, and then let's get in a rental car, and let's go to my little favorite restaurant on, on the beach in San Diego, the Pacific Coast Grill. If you've never been there, you ought to go there. It's really cool. And we go to the Pacific Coast Grill, and, and while we're having dinner, we look out at the ocean. We take one of the cups from the table. We walk down the stairs, go out to the ocean, and we scoop up a cup full of the Pacific Ocean in our cup. Question, what do you have in your cup? Nope. What do you have in your cup? Think bigger. What do you have in your cup? Yeah, the Pacific Ocean in your cup. Yeah, it's water, but it's the Pacific Ocean. You have in your hand the Pacific Ocean. Here's my question. When you look into the water, is there a whale in there? I hope not. <laughs> Maybe a minna, but not a whale. Are there surfers surfing inside your cup? No. Can you sell a cruise on that water in your cup? No, but you have the Pacific Ocean in that cup. Do you not? But you don't have it in its entirety. Stay with me. Of all the years I've been talking about God and serving God and reading about God and studying God and praying to God, 99% of God is still a mystery to me. I only understand about 1% of God. But I do love what I have in my cup. And so what you have in your cup is God, but we will never understand the entirety of God because we are not God. And so people say, well, then, Pastor, I just can't get with God because, you know, I, I got to get all my questions answered. Listen, you don't have all the answers to any entity you believe in. You don't. Can we prove it to you? If you went with me to San Diego today, if we did get on that plane... You would sit in a seat not seeing the guys or the gals flying the plane, not knowing their name except for if they tell you their name on an intercom system that you can't hear over the jet engines. But yet you trust, not knowing anything about aviation or the pilots in the cockpit, that you're going to get there safely because you believe, you trust. So how can we trust in two pilots we know nothing about but yet can't trust in a God that we see evidence that he exists? Deuteronomy 29.9. I love how this reads because this is God in our little cup. The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. This is beautiful. We're not accountable for them. 
You realize the things you don't understand you're not accountable for? But we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us. I don't know if Adam and Eve had navels. I don't know. I don't care. I don't know. I don't know how the earth was populated when the Bible tells me that he created one man and one woman. I don't know. But I trust because I'm here. God is the manager of the universe. I am not. And he has asked me to listen and to obey what he has revealed. The 1% that I can comprehend that's in my cup. There's a second way that God has revealed to us. A second way. And that's through the story of Christmas. His son, Jesus Christ. In fact, in fact there, was a, there was a time when... Um, Jesus was having a conversation with the disciples in John, you know, that intimate night in the upper room, John 14. He's talking about he's going back to the Father, and Philip pipes up and says, show us the Father. We want to see the Father. You know what he was asking for? Prove he exists. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because the Father is revealed, his revelation is through not just his word, but through Jesus. If you want to know what God looks like, if you want to know how God loves, look at Jesus. You see, when God came, or when, 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 when Jesus came to the world on Christmas, he came, watch, to restore the relationship that was broken in Genesis chapter 3. See, Adam and Eve were created by the hands of God, and they had perfect relation with Father God as they walked in the cool of the garden. Perfect relationship. Then somewhere along the way, evil entered, and for some reason, Adam and Eve decided to flip God off and do their own thing. And when that happened, separation happened. There was a separation between God the Father and his creation. And so, in that moment, watch, God did not abandon his creation. In Genesis 3, he started writing the Christmas narrative. That there would be a Savior that would come to bridge the gap between broken man and broken woman and a perfect God. And when Jesus came... He brought forth the kingdom of God, revealing who our Father is. So I wrote this down this week. I hope you like it. I hope you'll use it. Here's the Christmas story. God the Father sent God the Son to reintroduce sons and daughters to the Father. That's so good. I even told that to Sarah. She's like, that's really good, Brad. God the Father sent God the Son to reintroduce sons and daughters to the Father. And so that takes us back to the producer, takes us back to this Father God who didn't abandon us but wrote a narrative to save us. You know this verse, John 3, 16. For God, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, God loved you too much to leave you and abandon you. And then in Galatians 4, verse 4, the Bible says, But when the right time came... God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us so we could, uh, he could adopt, adopt. He could welcome us back into his family, adopt us as his very own children. So let's wrap this thing up today. Let's kind of talk about God the Father a little bit. And let's just kind of look at the dynamics that Jesus introduced us to. Because he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because Jesus reveals and unveils some things about God the Father that is incredible, and it applies to us right here in 2023. Now, when when Jesus came to earth, the Old Testament never referred to God as a father. You know your Old Testament is 39 books. Just think about it. This is my Bible, but but just look at that. This This is the Old Testament. This is the New. So most of your Bible is the Old Testament. 39 of the 66 books are the Old Covenant. The rest of those books are the New Covenant in Christ. And in the Old Covenant, these people that lived in this time, they were afraid to even say the name of God. God seemed distant. God seemed like he wasn't 
interested in them. And so they had laws. They had over 600 laws that they would try to keep to, to somehow appease a God that was distant. But then God said, I'm not distant. And after 400 years of silence, Jesus walks into the narrative in a manger. And here he is. And what is it proclaimed to the shepherds? Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. For the day in the city of David, a Savior has been born. In walked God into the narrative. Again, Jesus wasn't a man who became God. He was God who became a man. It's, it's God in skin. And as Jesus began to grow up and he began to do ministry, some unique things happened and some things that he said began to kind of click. And the religious leaders, the Old Testament mindsetted people, they heard some things and it infuriated them. And one of the things that they heard that really bothered them is when Jesus would refer to God as my father. You have to understand that that's a no-no because 39 books of the Old Testament, you never referred to God as my personal father. And yet Jesus says, hey, he's my father. That's how we roll in heaven. That's how we refer to one another. I refer to him as my father. But then one day, Jesus was, was doing ministry, and then, and then somehow, some way in the efforts of ministry, he starts praying to my father, and, and, and the disciples hear him pray, and the disciples who probably grew up praying say to themselves, um, okay, we pray, but not like that. I thought about this this week. How could I illustrate this to you? So I love to play golf. It's my hobby. It's my getaway. It's my sabbatical, as you learned last week. I love it. It fills me up most of the time. It also infuriates me a lot, but it fills me up. I love to be outside, love for the beauty of the golf. But listen, I, I, I like to think from time to time I'm pretty good at golf. Some of you have played with me, and, and, and you know there are days I'm not so good, but, but a lot of days I am good. But one day I went down to uh, this, this golf tournament that they used to hold in Irving, and they moved it to McKinney called the Byron Nelson. Have you ever heard of this? Well, this is back in the day when Tiger Woods wasn't a big deal yet, so he was still playing all the tournaments. And so one day I was down there, and I was like, hey, we'll get to see Tiger Woods. And so I get right behind the tee box on a par five when he hits his driver. And when he hit the ball, I realized in that moment that I'm not playing golf. He's playing golf. I don't know what the sport I'm playing is, but I don't hit it <laughs> near like that. Like, I don't do that. This is what's happening when the disciples hear Jesus praying. They're like, we pray, but that's praying. So they say to Jesus, 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 teach us how to pray like you. And what does he say? In Matthew 6, 9, he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father. Uh-oh. He's changed. It's not just my Father now. Look, it's our Father. You know what he just said? You don't have to pray to God and say, hey, Jesus told me I could. You, you pray because you're a part of the family of God through Jesus. In Jesus' name. You don't have to say, hey, Jesus is Father. <laughs> you say, our Father. He made it personal. He made it their Father. And this is massive. This is a huge deal that we could say, our Father. Listen to, listen to John 1, 12 through 13. To all who believed in him and accepted him, Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn. Not with a physical birth. You can't be reborn physically, resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So because I'm born of God, that's why Jesus says, I'm born again. Now when I pray, even though God is not my physical father, he is my father. And so I pray our father. But then Jesus took it to a whole nother level because he moved from my father to our father, and then he started looking at the people, and he says, he's your father. Now, this really infuriated the religious leaders. What? Yeah, he's personally your father. God, who in our human mind cannot be comprehended. God, the creator of the universe. God, the creator of everything you see. God, the creator of the mountains that you go to in the winter. God, the creator of the beach that you go to in the summer. God is your father. How massive is this? That Jesus would say, no, he's not my father. He's not just our father, but... He's your father. Listen to Isaiah 40, verse 12. Let this sink in. Who has scooped up the ocean in his two hands? Measured the sky between his thumb 
and a little finger. Have you ever seen those pictures on Instagram where people put their hand out like they're holding the moon? It's a manipulation of the photo. It makes it look, or, or like they're holding up the leaning tower of Pisa. God is actually doing that. He is actually holding the moon. And then verse 26, Isaiah says, Who marches this army of stars out each night, counts them off, calls each by name, and never overlooks a single one? And yet Jesus said, Hey, Brad, he's your father. How massive is that? And because he's my father, not just Jesus' father, look what happens in Matthew 7. This is the words of Jesus. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. It's like your kids wanting to go to Chick-fil-A and you're taking them to McDonald's. <laughs> right? I mean, McDonald's isn't Christian food. <laughs> if you then, though you are evil, which I know you're not evil, but we are sinners. If you and your humanity and your sinful humanity know how to give good gifts to your children, watch how much more your father, this is Jesus talking to the people, your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him. In verse six, or chapter 6, verse 4, give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. Matthew 6, verse 8, your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Have you ever been in a moment of prayer because you're going through great stress, great loss, great despair, great discouragement, you're hurting, you're crying, you're emotional, and you can't even say the words? Can I get a witness? You don't even know what to say to God. You're just in prayer to God. Here's what you say in that moment. You ready? Write this down. You know God. You know God. That's all you got to say. God, you know. My Father, you know. Because the Bible says he knows even before you ask. Now, let me just, just, let's just unpack that for a minute, the enormous, enormity of that. So God, who scoops oceans in his hands, God, who throws the stars out at night, never misses a one, that same God knows what you need before you ask. That means that God is really into you. He's really excited about you. He wants to have a relationship with you. That's the producer of Christmas. This Father God, who's Jesus' Father, but who's also our Father as a group, but He's also my Father personally. But He's not done because the Father wants to produce another epic. And it's your story, and it's my story. Because he wants to be your father, but he takes it one step further. And this is the beautiful piece today. See, there was a night that Jesus had a supper with his disciples in an upper room. We know it as the Last Supper because now the cross is coming into full view. Which, by the way, Jesus didn't stay in the manger. A lot of people like to worship Jesus in the manger, but he grew up. He had, he had a mission a cross and an empty tomb three days later for you and for me to restore that relationship that was broken in Genesis 3. And so that last night, he's having a conversation with his disciples. And then it says, after they had shared the meal together, they left the upper room and they made their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible says that the pressure of the moment, the pressure of the cross, the, the gravity of what he was about to experience was so heavy, the Bible says that he was sweating drops of blood on his forehead, which scientifically has been proven can happen. So he begins to pray. And in Mark 14, Mark records it this way. He went a little farther and he fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. And look at the next words. Abba, Father, he cried out. This is different. This is not my father. This is not our father. This is not your father. Abba. Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. And then he says, yet I want to do your will, not mine. What is the deal with Abba? It's not a band from the 70s. What is the deal with Abba, Father? Abba is a Greek word. And when the translators went to translate it, they just couldn't do it. They just left it Abba. But here's what it means. Ready? 
In that moment, when he said, Abba, Father, he was saying, Dad. But even greater than that, he was saying, Daddy. Daddy, I'm hurting. Daddy, this is tough. Daddy, I need you. Now it's Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, watch, us, Abba, Father. We now can cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. I don't know if you have experienced this yet. Chances are if your children are not grown, you haven't had this discussion. But our children are grown and both are married now. Some of them came in for Thanksgiving. It was beautiful. They went home. It was more beautiful. (laughs) I've never been so exhausted in my life. I love you if you're watching online. Um, But what happens is when your kids get married and they begin to grow into adults and they begin to live their own lives, you start having discussions as a married couple because you're bored and you have nothing else to talk about because you've been together for so long, you know each other's thoughts before they think them. So you'll have discussions like this. Well, you know someday our kids are going to have a child. You know, expectations are high right now at our house, but someday our children will have children. And when that happens, guess what? We're going to be grandma and grandpa. And when that came out, we were like, heck no. They're not calling us grandma and grandpa. We're 53. We're hip. I have a green jacket on. We are not doing that. We're still young. So you know what you start saying? What do you want to be called? You start playing the scenario out like when they do because you know they're going to because they're newlyweds, it's going to happen. If you've been married 30 years, I know you don't understand that, but, but, but they've been, they're, they're just like madly in love with each other and, and it's going to happen. So when it does, what do you want to be called? And so we've had that talk, Sarah and I, and we've, we've kicked tires on it and, and, uh, and we finally landed on, I want to be called Pops. Pops. And she's like, that's cool, Pops, Cocoa Pops. <laughs> I said, no, Pops. And then she said, oh, 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 if it's Cocoa Pops, I'll, I'll be Cocoa. <laughs> because I like coconut and I like chocolate. And I was like, good deal, because you are not a Nana. My mama's Nana. Here's what I want to tell you. When our kids were born, My mom and dad told us they wanted to be called Pappy and Nana. And now it's to the point that I refer to my mom and dad as Pappy and Nana. I don't call them mom and dad anymore. I call them Pappy and Nana. What's the deal with Pappy? What's the deal with Nana? Why do we work so hard? What names do we want to be called? Pops and Coco. Here's what we're saying. We want it to be intimate. We want it to be personal. We don't want it to be formal. We want our, our grandkids to feel comfortable calling us and say, hey, Pops, Pops, I'm in trouble, and I don't want my parents to know. <laughs> hey, hey, Coco, I'm in jail. <laughs> right? <laughs> Who knows, right? Coco, I need your help. Can you imagine if that relationship was so formal they couldn't approach us? That's why we come up with those names. This is what is happening when Jesus says, Abba, he's telling all of us that the bridge has been made between you and God. And so now you don't have to approach God with fear and trembling, thinking that somehow he's informal or unaccessible. He is your daddy. And when you're scared and you're in trouble, you can call out, Dad, Pops, I need you. Many of you know we just got back from Kentucky a couple weeks ago. I preached a revival in Somerset, Kentucky. I know you're like, revival? Did you have a tent? No, we were in a building. But I preached a four-day revival, and we had a blast in in Somerset, Kentucky. But they put us up, and some of you saw the pictures on my wife's Facebook feed. They put us up in an Airbnb old farmhouse that had been redone in the middle of two hollows in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. And the first thought I have after the guy who took us to the house left, I saw a door leading to the basement and there was a padlock on it. And I'm like, what's in the basement? 
I started thinking about how many people died in this house. (laughs) This is Saturday night. I got to preach three times on Sunday. We go to bed. She's snoring, and I'm thinking, we could be killed in here. (laughs) I started thinking about the front door. It's got a big square glass. I'm thinking that somebody could just knock it and just turn the deadbolt and come in and just kill us. I didn't sleep in about two hours. I had days off. I said, Daddy, I got to sleep. I got to preach for you tomorrow, Daddy. Give me rest. Give me peace. And I heard the voice of God say, Bro, I got you. I got you. Go to sleep. Rest. I got you. Got to church the next morning. Pastor Gary said, How'd you sleep? I said, Like trash. (laughs) You stick me out in the middle of nowhere. Never know who's coming over those hills in Kentucky. He said, oh, not a problem. You just need God in this. And he gave me his pistol, and I slept like a baby. (laughs) Like a baby the next two nights. I got the pistol laying right next to the bed. So it's like, if I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, don't shoot me. (laughs) Oh, that's, that's our daddy. When you're scared, when you don't know, when you can't find the answer, Stop working so hard and cry out to dad. Abba, father. He's not just my father, our father, your father. He's our daddy. God, thank you so much for the story of Christmas. That when we went astray, you didn't abandon us in our sin, but you wrote the Christmas narrative. You began producing, underwriting, controlling the narrative that would bring us back into relationship with you through your son, Jesus. So God, we don't come to you today trying to understand everything about you for our brains don't wrap that far. We just believe, submit, and surrender. And we thank you that you're not distant. You're not formal. You're not, you're not non-interested in us. You, you're, you're our dad. You've adopted us through Christ into your family. And by that, we have access to you. In the quietness of this moment, maybe, you, maybe you're not a part of the family of God today. You're here. Someone invited you. Maybe or you just stopped in, or maybe you're watching online, and, and you've realized you, you celebrate Christmas, but you don't know the Savior of Christmas. And here's what I want to tell you. Don't go through another Christmas. Celebrating a Savior that's not your Savior. Give your life to Christ. Say yes. Surrender to Him. I know you're never going to have all the answers. There's a lot of things that you surrender to in this life that you don't have the answers to. But God sent forth Jesus, born of a virgin. On that first Christmas morning, and as crazy as this may sound, when God sent Jesus... You were on his mind. And eventually Jesus went to the cross and he died for you. Would you just surrender? And would you believe that three days later God raised him from the dead? Life won't be perfect, but you will have peace that passes human understanding. But better than anything, you'll have a promise that you have eternity with God the Father. Just surrender to him today. God, thank you again for the Christmas narrative. I thank you that you didn't abandon us, that you loved us, that you still love us. You want a relationship with us. Thank you that we can cry out, Abba, in any time, any place. We love you, God. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Our prayer team's going to be down front. If you need prayer about anything, they're available today. Other than that, God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week for the director.